Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Benita Stewart and DeRay McKesson. <laughs> well, thank you, William, uh, for just the introduction to this very special uh, talk that we have uh, this afternoon. I'm, I'm personally excited uh, to sit next uh, to DeRay um, because he's just had such an impact um, in one way or another in all of our lives. Uh, so, DeRay, let's just start. You've had an incredible personal journey. Um, you follow things that are, you're most passionate about. So I saw where you actually were in the public school system, uh, human resources uh, official there. But tell us about your personal journey. And we talked about you know being born in Baltimore, spending time in Minnesota. But how did you follow all of these uh, passions? How did you set out on this path? So I'll start by saying it's an honor to be here. It's great to be here. It's always a joy to talk about this work. I do wish, though, that we didn't have to spend so much time fighting systems and structures that were killing us so we could go do the cool things that like make us sort of joyous about the world. So I'm mindful of that. Um, I think about this, you know, I, I was in student government like my whole childhood, and, and that was really important to me. Both of my parents were addicted to drugs. My mother left when I was three, um, and she came back when I was 30. I just turned 33. This is my Jesus year, which is like, <laughs> <laughs> amen. <laughs> but my mother left, yeah, so she just came back a couple years ago, three years ago. Um, and my father, like, I cleaned when I was around three, four, and I think about that because in so many ways I grew up in, like, a community of recovery. Like, I grew up seeing people put their lives back together in ways that they didn't always think was possible, and, like, that was childhood for me. Like, I I'll never forget coming down um, from my bedroom one day, and I see this guy sitting on the couch, and I'm like, he looks really familiar. And it was one of my sister's friends, and I'm like, why is he in our house in the morning? Like, why is he on the couch? And he was recovering, and my father was, like, counseling him through recovery, and, like, that was, I have so many memories of that. And I think about that all the time because like, I know what it's like to see communities like sort of break and come back together. And I think about sort of this work in resistance is like seeing things break and believing that they can come back together. But I taught and teaching was probably like the single coolest, most important, like magical thing I've ever done. I taught sixth grade math here in East New York, Brooklyn. And sixth grade is beautiful. Seventh grade is puberty and deodorant, but sixth grade is like still <laughs> um, a lot of magic. And if you've never been in a group of kids who don't know they need deodorant, that is seventh grade. Um, sixth grade is like a lot of joy. And um, I'll never forget one day I was like, you know, I taught 60, 90, and 120 minute classes, which is like a long time for 11 year olds to do anything, let alone math. And um, they were like, can we go to gym early? And I'm like, absolutely, you can go to gym early. I'm tired of you, you're tired of me. Like we've been together for a long time. First, second, third, fifth, and seventh period, this one class. So I let them go and they come back really quickly and they're like, they're like back in my classroom. I'm like, why are you back so quick? And I realize that they're in love with the idea of gym more than the work of gym. <laughs> and I say that because in moments like this, I think people are more in love with the idea of resistance than the work of resistance. Mm. And the question for me now, like four years after we were in the streets initially in Ferguson, it's like, what does the work look like? Like, how do we use spaces like this if we ever are going to just keep talking about it to actually like force people to engage in the work and not just the conversation of these things? So I got into it because Mike Brown got killed. I was on my couch. And um, I was like, this is crazy. So I'm going to go. And the, the least I can do is like, just go for the weekend. I was like, I'm going to go for Saturday and Sunday. Um, and I went. And the second night I was in St. Louis was the first night I got tear gas. And I was like, this is wild. I'll do whatever I can to make sure that nobody else has to experience this. So I quit and did all these other things. And in hindsight, now I'm like, that was sort of like, what was I doing? But <laughs> I did it. And so many other people did it. And I'm proud that I was not the only person. There were so many incredible people in St. Louis who, like, did whatever they could to make a difference and, like, continue to do that work. As a father of a 12-year-old, I can attest, yes. <laughs> Deodorant is a big thing. It's, <laughs> it's real. And like, you don't hurt their feelings. So you're like, hey, that smell. You're like, this is free gifts for class. You're like, this is what? Exactly. I have to stand over him in the bathroom, like, put in there right now. Um, <laughs> but you, you, you mentioned a little earlier about uh, your personal experience of, with uh, communities breaking and re knitting them together. Um, how, how, does, how does technology play a role in that from, from your point of view? 
so two things. One is like sort of the, the platforms, and the second is like the people like you all who make these things real. When I think about, you know, Twitter, if not for Twitter, Missouri would have tried to convince you that we didn't exist, like literally. If we had not been able to tell our own stories in real time, like they would have been like, those people aren't really out there. And you're like, are you kidding? You know, people forget that in 2014, in August, September, and October 2014, it was illegal to stand still in St. Louis. So if you saw us marching, it wasn't that we thought marching was like a really cool thing to do. It was the five second rule. So if you sit still for more than five seconds, you were arrested. And like, we remember that because that was crazy to us and that was real. And we sort of just adjusted and we sued them and it got deemed unconstitutional. But like, if not for, I remember my tweet about the five second rule was the first uh, public recorded instance of the rule. So when we sued them, like I had to testify and literally the judge is like, what is Twitter? And I'm like, it's Twitter. You know, like, he's like, what is a tweet? And like, we're literally recounting like my tweet thread about the five second rule. And like, if not for social media, we just wouldn't have been able to do that. I remember Jack, the CEO of Twitter, is a, is a friend, and I remember getting a call from him being like, DeRay, we're gonna buy this company that like is called Periscope because we don't have any shirt. Like, I remember that call, but like, that was late, you know what I mean? Like, we'd already been in that, all we could use is Vine, you know? So in the beginning, we literally would like, we'd record a video on our iPhones, then we'd go run off to the side, upload it in Vine, and like scroll through trying to find the best six seconds, and then post it online. Like, that was like our strategy to do because that, that was, there was no Twitter video, there was no Facebook Live, there was no YouTube streaming, like those things didn't exist back then. Mm -hmm. And they're critics of us who will say things like, you chase the cameras, and we're like, we were the cameras, you know what I mean? Like we were, like, we were it, you know, we were the people telling the truth. The second part of this though is like the people in places like this, and um, you know, I'm always mindful that like people made these things, like these things don't just like emerge out of thin air, right? And what I found over four years is that is that when we think about leaders, we often get leaders, whether they're leaders of the country, not this guy, but like other people, um, or leaders of, of companies, and they do things like we're everybody's CEO, right? Like we don't just we don't just lead the black people or the black and brown people, we're everybody. Like they use sort of that language as if that's supposed to be some inclusive statement. But the reality would be if you were everybody's CEO, you would be like marshalling and marching white people to a vision of equity and justice, because like that would be what leadership looks like looks like, right? right? And like what you find in places that, I've definitely seen tech companies like hide behind this vision of inclusivity that is actually like not about equity, that's not about justice, mm -hmm. but it's this idea that tech is sort of neutral. And you're like, none of this stuff is neutral, right? So I worry about what that looks like in companies, um, like across the tech community. Mm -hmm. And the second is like, what is people's proximity to these issues? So you see a lot of companies who are like, we care, da da da. And it's like, there are a lot of people who think that the country got bad with the Muslim ban, right? And like the country's been bad way before the, the Muslim ban is bad. Mm -hmm. That is not the beginning of the bad though, right? right? Or it takes like a tragedy hitting one set of employees for people to be like, oh my God, the country. And you're like, how close are you to these issues that you say you care about every day? And that we actually could be using tech to do something really interesting and cool about. And like, I worry about what that looks like. We know, you know, somebody who's not in tech, I know what the issues are. I want to believe that if people who knew how to like do something in a tech space just knew the issues better, they'd be able to help us brainstorm. You know, so you think about what does it mean in California that one in 11 homicides is committed by an officer or a third of all the people killed by a stranger in this country is actually killed by a police officer. Like those are sort of wild things, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and want to believe that like we can figure out how to capture data better, or like we can figure out how to visualize this stuff better, that if you get killed in this country and a newspaper doesn't write about you, you literally are not in the data set, like you don't exist. So any number you've ever heard about police violence comes from the aggregate of newspaper reports. There are two years in Florida recently that they reported no killings by police. You're like, well, we know that's not true. You know what I mean? Like, that's just a lie. So it's like, how do we help people like you get close enough to the issue so you can help us brainstorm like real systemic things to do something about it? So it's interesting um, when you think about the role of technology. My husband always jokes, he said, who would have thought Steve Jobs, if he only knew that he was the original, you know, purveyor of justice? Because with the invention of the mobile, the iPhone was a real start and then aggregating all of the apps such as Twitter and Instagram and YouTube and you know all of this in terms of, of technology and putting it in the hands of people. Um, you talk a little bit about the truth and the, there's different sides of it. One in terms of now everyone is carrying the device, you know, the, the device that can either 
speak to truth, or in some cases, one of the areas that we're focused on, which we announced with the Google News Initiative, is around media literacy, um, so that people understand what is the truth, you know, being um, a, a big supporter of quality journalism. So how are you thinking about technology and driving the truth um, and what role, could, quite frankly, could we play as a technology company? Because now there's things that are popping up because people have the devices. And we could probably turn on the news tonight, and there will be some story about someone that has been recorded, and they're trying to explain the truth. And I, I do think with, uh, particularly with underrepresented minorities, quite frankly, that becomes, for us, a source of truth. And so how, how are you thinking about the literacy, the truth, and then the technology all combined? Yeah, so we never want to confuse like awareness for action, right? That like understanding the problem is like a part of the work and like seeing that the world is screwed up like has to be the first step. There's some people who think that that is like the whole equation though, right? And like we just know that that is not true, especially four years later. That like a, you see another video of the police killing somebody, if you're shocked now, it's sort of like, where were you, right? Like that's not, not that is not necessarily like a special thing in this moment. What we'd also say though is that there are people who, who have yet to understand that this is not a system of chances, this is not a system of constants, that this is a system of choices. The best thing that we can do is help people like see what those choices were that have been made before to set us up to make a different set of choices. Like that, that is what we think is really important. So we think about the police as an example, that four years ago I would have been like, it's a screwed up system with bad people making bad decisions. Now I'm like, the game is just rigged, right? So you look at California, California has a law that says any investigation of an officer that lasts more than a year can never result all in discipline regardless of the outcome. That just like doesn't make, that's just like a different set of rules. In Cleveland, disciplinary records are destroyed after 60 days, after one year, different set of rules, right? Like we're just not actually playing the same game. And what we've started to do is like help people figure out like here's a game that's being played. I think that's one of the things that the right does really well. They're very quiet about it, but they just change like the playing field. We have been seduced to believe that like the best argument wins. And if we make like the best case and, and like the best argument doesn't win, the argument that's like beating the people's head over and over, that is what wins. I think that we've forgotten how to do that sometimes. So when I think about like the role of tech, I think there's some huge data things that like people could be working on. So like you probably heard people talk about bail reform and like all the stuff with bail. Yep. There's actually like very little data about bail. It just like doesn't exist. So we know that when people go before the bail judge or the bond hearing, or whatever, that like there's a stenographer taking down everything. But that is where that's the only place that like the bail amounts are recorded. So like you've never seen a study on like bail by judge. You've never seen a study on bail by demo any demographic indicator because like the data just doesn't, there is no data, right? So there's a ton of stuff where like there's just like not data, but we know these issues are things. If I ask you right now, like what's a felony, what would you say? Um, what's the technical definition like, of a felony? Give me an example of a felony. Uh, breaking and entering. Breaking and entering. Stealing a car. Give me a stealing a car. Mm -hmm. So like that to a certain extent. Well, what about you? Um, I, if you were Any robbing a bank. Robbing a bank. <laughs> Robbing a bank. When you ask most people what's a felony, they say these like big things, right? They're like blowing up a building, killing two people, <laughs> robbing a bank. In Virginia, up until this year, theft over two hundred dollars was a felony. In Florida, to this day, theft over three hundred dollars is a felony. In both of those states, when you become a felon, you permanently lose the right to vote. Yeah. That is wild. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when people like we've been conditioned to think about felons as people who have like killed ten people, smiled, and taken a picture, right? Like that is like how you. That's like what you think about a felon, and you're like. A felon is stealing like a Chromebook, yeah. an app, an iPod, like that is how people are being disenfranch disenfranchised, like at scale, do you know what I mean? But that's actually not the story that you hear the most. In Oklahoma, up until 2001, theft over $50 was a felony. So the way that we've been conditioned to think about these problems is like a real issue. So what we would say is that like people in tech, people who know how to look at aggregate data, like the more that we can uncover and unearth these things and visualize them in a way that helps people realize that the only radical thing is the fact that we are talking about it, right? Like the fact that we're fighting the system is not the radical piece. The fact that we have to fight the system is like the crazy radical thing in the first place. But there are all these like minor things that people just don't know. The last thing I'll say is how many people are on a jury? This is not a trick question. I have been. 
How many people? How many? Well, oh, how many? Yeah. I, don't know. He's well, like, I was one. Yes. <laughs> it's like 12 angry men. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's how Very you remember it. There are two states in the country where it only takes 10 of the 12 people to convict you of a felony. So in Louisiana, you can get convicted with life without the possibility of parole and a 10 a 10-12 vote, a 10-2 vote, which is so wild. And in Louisiana, it's directly tied to integration that when black people started sitting on juries, they literally held a constitutional convention so they could change the threshold so that black people would never be able to lower the conviction rate. And in Oregon, it's Louisiana and Oregon. In Oregon, it was about Jews because Oregon, you know, is the only state that banned black people from leaving the state. So they had already discriminated against them, so juries weren't the pathway to do it, uh, but they did it for Jews. And you're like, that is nuts. So to this day, mm -hmm. Like in Louisiana right now, and hopefully it'll get changed in November uh, because it'll be up in the ballot. Like it only takes 10 people. And I only found out because I did a six hour tour of Angola, which is the biggest prison in the, the biggest prison comp complex in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I was asking like one of the inmates, like, what don't I know? And he was like, you probably don't know that it only takes 10 people to send us here. And you're like, that is nuts, you know? Like there are these structural things that don't make the public conversation, but actually are ringing more people into the net. And we don't talk about those. And like, we try and spend more time on those things now uh, than the stuff that you see every day in the newspaper. Your, your comment about awareness and action, I mean, that our, our forum today is actually to, to tie those two together because you're, you're right, education and awareness, like we're, we're, we're beyond that. And I uh, speak personally, and I think for many Googlers in the room, they're, they're looking for ways to, to connect and to drive their awareness and their, you know, their outrage into something that's very constructive. Uh, case in point, you raised the thing about uh, technology and uh, data. Uh, I think one of the organizations that's here today that's um, tabling outside after our talks is the Vera Institute of Justice. Yeah, yeah. we sit, love Vera. Yeah, um, I sit on the board of the Vera Institute of Justice and uh, Google is partnering with Vera to uh, do a project to illuminate and bring out um, how mass incarceration actually is being driven by smaller regional, smaller jurisdictions around the country, not the big cities. Actually, the big cities are, are doing a lot, um, either because they got woke or they realize they don't have the money to do it, to, to de-emphasize incarceration. It's actually the smaller jurisdictions around the country, um, mostly in red states and rural areas, that in the aggregate is driving up mass incarceration. And our thought is, like, let's get the data out there. Let's go out and educate politicians and those folks who live in those communities on how they're actually contributing to this overall, uh, you know, emphasis on incarceration. But um, just wanted to make that plug. Um, but I did want to want to ask you ask you a question though about. Um, about stories and surfacing stories, what you do in um, in your podcasts. Uh, to Benita's point about uh, media literacy, I think it's do you, there. There's a role there of, of surfacing news stories that are actually kind of getting suppressed because of you know the deluge of uh, what we're reading in the newspapers that are important. Can you tell us a, a little bit about that? Like some stories that you've recently come across. Yeah, so the podcast is called Pate of the People. Shout out to Sam. Sam's on the podcast too. Sam is here. I love hey, Sam. Hey, Sam. Um, <laughs> is, so when I started the podcast a year ago, it was one of the first have to be about like all the news you don't know that's really important. You're going to hear about Trump whether you want to or not. So we didn't feel like we need to spend a whole lot of time on him because, you know, <laughs> you're going to hear him anyway. Uh, so we do. And like there's some pieces of news that the way it works is the four of us, everybody picks their piece of news every week. They put in the group chat. We don't hear your argument about the news until we record. So it's sort of like we're learning when you say it. And there's some things, like there was a study that says that is like pushing back on the idea that people get, people get more conservative as they get older. And what the study is saying is that like poor people and people of color actually just never get older. So it's not that, it's not that people are getting more conservative. It's that like some people just never have the luxury of getting old. And you're like, I hadn't thought about that, right? Like that's really interesting. Or uh, on the news tomorrow, you probably heard about the straw ban in Seattle as like uh, people talk about it as like a really important thing for the environment. The disability community is really frustrated because they're, pe they're like, they're people with disabilities who need straws, right? And like when you have now made straws illegal, like what happens for people who can't use their hands, 
for people who need disposable straws, like a permanent straw is not actually the most hygienic for a set of people. So like trying to look at the, these issues that people take for granted and look at them from a different angle. The straw story is really interesting too because it's all predicated on this study that says that we use 500 million straws a day. Uh, when you ask about the study, the study comes from a nine-year-old who did a phone survey <laughs> and I'm like, that literally is like the source of the study. So like Snopes and everybody has like tried to figure out like what's the source of the study. And the guy's like, I did it when I was nine. And he's like 16 now. People are like, but like every major news organization has like cited this study as like 500 million straws a day. And you're like, ah! like was it like was that a science fair project? You know, like what? Where the where the where the straw study come from? So mm. we try and look at these issues from like a different angle hopefully setting listeners up with like a different set of skills to be able to like ask questions and think about things in a way they might not have otherwise. Uh, and then we do have interviews. So tomorrow uh, is Ocasio-Cortez, who is a big deal here in New York and across the country. And she was like even more impressive in person. Um, and we're gonna have to edit some of the interview because it was an hour and the whole podcast is an hour. But I asked her this question um, about her mom. I'm like, was your mom there on election day? And she's like, Yep, my mom was there and there wasn't really a story about election night. And she was like, my mom stayed the next day. And she's like, I was doing all this media and like, there's more media than I've ever done. So I wasn't at the house. And she's like, my mom calls and is like, hey, like the New York Post just came by. And she's like, okay, how was it? She was like, oh, chill interview, not a big deal, da, da, da. <laughs> and she's like, okay, next day, front page of the Post is like, oh, Kazio Cortez running for president. And she's like, mom, <laughs> what did you say to them? <laughs> and she's like, I told them my baby could be president one day. <laughs> like, she's like, never, ever talk to the press. You're like, ban if people, just tell them I'm not home. And you're like, I, you know, she was actually really, she had other things to say about he like politics, but I thought that was like such a great, she was like so great with it. Uh, but it, it was this conversation when I started the podcast about how do we like invite people into conversations that they might not mm -hmm. be a part of before. So Alcazar Cortez, we had Snowden on like really early. He was like the third interview I did to talk about the intersection of like security and race, right? Because Snowden doesn't really talk about race, um, but wanted to create a space where we could talk about like what race looks like in the security conversation. Um, and those sort of things wanted to be a home and a place like led by active we're like, we can just sort of say what we want that we believe is true. Yeah. We're going to, if you have questions, this is a, an opportunity to start lining up. And then um, we have a few more questions for DeRay. I, I want to just circle back on the law enforcement. We talked about podcasts and audio and the importance of audio. Um, but now technology is coming to police enforcement. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you think from an audio perspective and, and technology, the fact that this is now being captured um, with video, there, uh, there's audio, how, how, what is your view of um, the technology in the law enforcement and how you think it will be used or not used? Or the consequences we were talking earlier about, are there consequences you know, based on now having um, actual proof. Yeah, so I think technology has like been in policing for better or for worse for a long time, right? I think body cameras are like the newest iteration that most people have public language about. Um, when the Obama administration was still in, in play, we had been talking to their team. They were partnering with the university to figure out if they could use the audio specifically to measure aggression in an officer's voice. So not just looking at the video, but like could we see spikes in temper and things like that just by the audio, which is sort of an interesting way to think about using body cameras that don't just rely on the footage. So that's an interesting thing. I like we should follow up and see where they are. There is new technology too that allows for um, that allows to trigger the body cameras, like when a police door opens, things like that, that don't require the officer to press a button anymore, but just like automatically turn on the dash cam or things like that. Like, you know, we're in a minority in the, in the movement conversation about cameras because a lot of people rightly are nervous about body cameras as being like another tool of surveillance, right? That if community policing really is your code for like, putting police in black neighborhoods, because they're not gonna be on the Upper West Side in the same way you're putting them in other places, and if community policing becomes this idea that like the police need to know my kid's name not to kill them, right? Like you don't need to play football with my child not to kill him, right? Like, but that is sort of how people like use this idea of community policing. If that is the case, you put cameras on people and now you just like are surveilling the whole neighborhood. So that is not a good thing. What is interesting about the video thing is that in the like 1% of police officers who are ever charged with anything, uh, 
like videos are actually really important, right? So that's sort of we get stuck is that like it is the likelihood of you getting charged without a video is sort of is probably not happening, right? Yeah. The video is like our only sort of slight pathway to there being some sort of accountability, which is why we veer to video rather than not video, which is sort of the complicated piece about it. Um, with all the technology used in policing, we believe that there should be like public oversight, right? So what you find in a lot of cities is that the body camera footage is actually like under the purview of the police department, only the police department, nobody has access to it. And like that, we don't believe that that is like a just way to think about any of this stuff. And that is really hard. So I think that we're in this new space where like people now have the language to talk about like the technology. Uh, but the police would advocate for like all types of stuff. They want like facial recognition. It's like y'all aren't so solving any crimes any better, right? Like that, none of that's gonna like build the trust that you broke and you broke the trust, right? And like I'm not convinced that technology is gonna be the salve for like how you rebuild that trust in communities, even if police like want that to be like the magic bullet. Why don't we go to some Q and A before yeah. uh, before we come to a close? Jonathan, uh, Jonathan why don't you start us? First of all, I uh, just want to say thank you, DeRay, not only for being here today and sharing all your wisdom with us, but for the sacrifices that you've put in, put yourself in front of and the sacrifices that you've made in this movement because you've put your body, your health, and your time on the line time and time again. So personally, just want to thank you for that because that is something that often goes overlooked when we talk about this work. Uh, two quick questions for you. First question being, when we think about the work of making change scalable, something that Google, we always talk about, how can we solve problems at scale? And so oftentimes people grab onto one thing, well, if we get body cameras, that will solve the issue. Or if we make sure that we have community policing, that will solve the issue. But these issues are much deeper uh, than just one solution. So how, when you have these conversations and try to get people involved, how do you keep uh, a level of depth to the conversation, but still make it attainable for people to feel like, I feel I can get involved. Involved. This isn't too big enough for me to get involved. And the second question I have is, you have a popular saying on the podcast that we each owe a debt that we can never pay back. So it's our job to pay it forward and to pay it to the next generation. Um, how do you live that and how do you pay it forward? Yeah, so one of the things I didn't say about the technology thing that I just thought of is that what we learned recently is that the company, the biggest producer of body cameras in the country, actually intentionally makes the quality of the body cameras really awful to like not be better than the human eye because they want it to be so that officers can say that they were confused about the toy gun or the real gun, right? But we actually know the technology exists today that can make the body camera footage like crystal clear, but you've never seen a crystal clear body camera. Like thing, not because cameras are bad in 2018, but because they're intentionally made to be bad. So what would it look like if we believe that body cameras are part of the solution for another company to make them with just like clear footage, right? Like that would actually, so that you can't confuse a toy gun with the real gun because on the footage we would see that it is not, is that we learned recently that they like actually want the, the quality to be grainy so that like there can be confusion, which is sort of like a wild, um, wild thing. The, your first question about like, what do, what do we do? We believe that like, 10 years ago, we didn't know how we got here per se, but we knew we were here, right? We knew there was like all these black people getting locked up. We knew it was all these wild disparities, but we didn't know sort of like how. Now we're at a place, and this is one of the things that Sam and I and, and Brittany are trying to figure out. Is like, what would it be like to map all the things that got us here, right? So from mapping all the like, all the felony theft amounts across the country to like how much prison phone calls cost to like all the contracts for ICE. Like, what if we create a space that is like, Here's how mass incarceration is upheld in like your city and town. And like, it's just there for people. So activists and organizers and citizens no longer have to spend 10 years trying to like find that random law or like uncover that thing. They actually know what it is already. So they spend their energy fighting it as opposed to finding it, right? And so much of the work right now is people, you spend all day trying to find it. You're like, I think this thing is bad. I don't know how it got here. I don't know. But like, we actually believe that in this day and age, we can actually do that work, right? Like a set of us can figure out how to build that thing. So you, you can know the felony theft amount in like your town. You can know how many people were killed by the police. You can know like their places. I don't know if you remember when Alton Sterling got killed, there was a press conference by the the police chief and the police chief one of the things he says is like you should pick up the phone and file a complaint and baton rouge you actually can't file a complaint over the phone so like i don't that was a weird thing that he said um and there are a lot of places in the country where you can't file anonymous complaints against the police like every complaint has to be signed and you have to like swear an oath that like it is true mind you you can i could call in 10 anonymous complaints about any of y'all right now to the 
New York City Police Department, and they would take it as fact, right? So how do we like set it up so that you already know what the good and bad is and like you can fight about that? And we spend a lot of time on that. And we believe that that is like a good on ramp for people. So you don't have to figure, you don't have to like spend all day trying to figure out like what is bad and what is not. Somebody can tell you those things. The second thing is that like the more you know, the better you'll do. And there are people who like sort of believe in immigration stuff and don't know anything about immigration. You're like, well, that's not really helpful, right? So like the closer, the more proximate you are to an issue, you find people, especially people with like skills in this way, they start to ask more questions and they're like, let me build a thing or let me test this thing out or let me partner. Like those things are actually like really, really powerful. The idea of paying it forward is like, what I try to do is like, how do we create space for other people, right? So one of the cool things about the pod is that because it's mine, I can like get anybody going I want to, you know? So like, I was telling them backstage, I had Stacey Abrams on like four months before it was even like a, it was even a thing in Georgia, right? But she was like, I need to be on early. I'm like, got you, right? Or like, there's a black guy running for the governor of Wisconsin. I didn't even know he, I didn't know there were a lot of black people in Wisconsin. You know, like, I didn't know, right? So we had him on, he was great. He used to be a firefighter. Like we had this whole great conversation about firefighting. I asked him, I was like, is being a firefighter on TV anything like it is on in real life? And he's like, no, obviously. And he was like, if you ever see firefighters on TV shows talk in a burning building, that's like the craziest thing ever. He's like, you can't talk. He's like, the building's burning. He's like, there's no, he's like, there's no conversations happening in burning buildings. I was like, ah. And he also said, um, he was like, uh, like occupational cancer is the biggest cause of death in firefighters. And I was like, is that the smoke? And he was like, yeah, it's not just smoke though. It's like what happens when furniture burns. And I was like, you know, if I wasn't doing all this justice stuff, I would do a whole project on furniture burning. I like hadn't even thought about like how the smoke changes when a refrigerator burns, you know, right. like and what that means. And he was like, it, it, he was like, after 20 years, it just will seep into your skin. It just will, right? So the podcast is an interesting space where we get to like put people on in a way that like otherwise wouldn't. And the other thing is that we spend a lot of time like connecting people behind the scenes with this idea that like all the bad people know each other, even if they don't like each other inside the Republican Party right now. Um, the good people don't all know each other. So like when we meet like a dope artist or a dope whatever, it's like, do you know this person? Let me connect you with this person so that we can create a network of people who like all are a part of the same fight. Thank you. Hey, my name is Andrew Leibowitz, and uh, I'm a new person to Google. I just want to say, first of all, thank you to Ray for doing the pod, and I love Crooked Media. Definitely listen to it a lot. Long drives in the car definitely makes it get easier. Uh, I wanted to run something by you and get your opinion on something. Uh, it's from a book labeled Anti-Semite and Jew from 1944, published after France was liberated, but while the Holocaust was reaching a crescendo. Uh, it's by the philosopher Jean-Paul Sarty. Never believe that anti-Semites are completely unaware of the absurdity of their replies. They know that their remarks are frivolous, open to challenge, but they are amusing themselves, for it is their adversary who is obliged to use words responsibly. Since he believes in words, the anti-Semites have the right to play. They even like to play with discourse for, by giving ridiculous reasons, they, like, they discredit the seriousness of their interlockers. They delight in acting in bad faith since they seek not to persuade by sound argument, but to intimidate and disconcert. If you press them too closely, they will abruptly fall silent, loftily indicating by some phrase that the time for argument is past. I think that one of the ways that whiteness works, right, is that whiteness always sets a set of rules that it never has to play by. Like that is like a, one of the fundamental things. So like when you think about Trump, it's like incredible that Trump gets to be this person who believes in the importance of law enforcement while literally dismantling the FBI, right? Like if I came out, the FBI has already visited my house, but if I came out and said this stuff, <laughs> Like, if I said half the stuff that he says about the FBI, I get another visit. But he, like, is just firing people left and right, but still, like, believes in law enforcement or, like, anything about women and family value. You're, like, it's sort of a fascinating thing right. that happens. Um, my only sort of reflection on that is that, like, we, and Ocasio-Cortez said this, she was like, we should be swinging for the fences, right? Mm -hmm. That, like, the we go, what is it, when, we, when they go low, we go high, it's like, we might go high into oblivion sooner or later, right? That like yeah. our high should be because we're swinging and fighting everything below us, right? Like not because we are like taking the high ground in this like moral space, especially when we're fighting people who have a loose sense of morals at all. What I'm also reminded is that like 
change can come really quickly. If they can rewrite the tax code on scrap paper, then like we can do all this stuff really quickly. Yes. And part of the way that like the power imbalance works is that we think that we have to make this like 20 year case and da 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 and, and like we don't actually, have, if they can, they literally rewrote the tax code, like I'm not being dramatic on the back of scrap paper, it literally was on the back of scrap paper and like the Congress people hadn't even read it. Like if they can do that, we can undo all this stuff pretty quickly. But half the battle is like convincing people that that's even possible. And like, we got to figure that out. I think, you know, on the pod tomorrow that comes out, we talk about the Trump administration has declared, literally, I'm not being dramatic, they have declared the war on poverty over, that like there is no more poverty in America. That is like a new report oh. that they just put out. Uh, and the UN is like, there are 18.5 million people in poverty. And literally, Nikki Haley's team is like, there are only 250,000 people in poverty in the country. And you're like, what is going on? But it is this thing that they get that they, the original power is in definition, right? right? Like being able to define the terms is a huge sense of power. And like, we can't concede that. And I think that we have in so many ways, you think about even abolish ICE. ICE should be abolished, ICE is bad. The end of ICE is not the presence of a pathway to citizenship, right? right. And like, we have confused it to you. So we can like get ICE out of here and still have not won anything about the immigration battle that we're actually fighting. And part of that is that we've ceded some ground on like what the immigration battle is. The immigration battle is not a battle about ICE. The immigration battle is about a pathway to citizenship. And what we would say is that the pathway to citizenship does not require the detention and deportation of people. That is where ICE fits in. But like the macro argument is like always the big fight we should be having. And we like lose that battle so many times. What do we do to keep it, in your opinion? I think that we like fight it even when it feels like we shouldn't. So like the ICE thing is like we should be all, everybody who believes in like a pathway to citizenship, that should be like our talking point. Every day should be like, and ICE should be a part of it, but like the macro argument is about a pathway to citizenship. It's not fighting about this little thing. Because if we get the end of ICE, that, that actually still doesn't get us a pathway to citizenship. You know what I mean? Like we could get this small thing and still not win the battle. Right. The right is really good about like always, we know their vision. Kick everybody out, like can't come here, white people, don't, like, their affirmative is like pretty clear to us. Uh, and you know, it was projected that the country is gonna be a majority minority by 2043-ish. Uh, it's now projected that the net effect of his immigration acts is gonna delay that by another 10 years, right? So like they are playing a game like with a set of outcomes that they get and we get so, uh, invested in like the emotional piece because like you shouldn't put kids in cages, that is like a true thing. Right. That sometimes we forget the like macro argument that is actually the battle. That's fair. Hi, um, thanks so much for being here. I'm a huge fan. Been following you since uh, Ferguson, since I was in law school, watching the videos uh, coming straight from people on the streets. Uh, and yeah, just appreciate all the work that you do. Uh, my name's Alex. I work at the Bronx Freedom Fund, a revolving community bail fund in the Bronx and Queens. Um, so I really appreciate you mentioning bail uh, and then this farce that there's a, the war on poverty is over uh, because there are currently 3,000 men and women predominantly of color on Rikers Island right now who are only there because they can't afford to pay their bail. Um, so... I, uh, and also a lot of them are children, uh, 16 and 17 year olds are still on Rikers Island right now. Um, so I like that you highlighted the fact that there is currently a scarcity of bail data. Um, so plug for us, we're actually spearheading a court watching program. Uh, so if you're interested on collecting bail data or um, analyzing it, come and see me outside. Um, but how do, what is the role of community bail funds in turning awareness into action? Yeah, so a couple of things about bail is that one, I wanna believe, and I know nothing about tech, I just, this is, these are my dreams you guys are gonna hear. <laughs> is that like, I wanna believe that somebody can build like a scraping something that can scrape all the stenographers like notes and like, make the bail data so we don't have to only do, court watching is the only way that we have any data and like Chicago has a great data set from court watching. I'm excited that you're gonna do it. And like we should do that cause like that's the best we can do right now. But because we know somebody is in the courtroom writing down like the approved bail amount, like it is on somebody's it's on a paper somewhere. Like if that's scam, like I wanna believe some smart person can like figure out how to put that somewhere. So that's my plug for it. That is what any of you do. Like, <laughs> please make it. I've looked into it. So it actually, uh, you can get the court transcripts from arraignments, um, but they cost money. So it's really just a money issue. And it is possible. Yeah, yeah. It, like we've been trying to figure out is there a way, we should talk after this. Yes. We've been like sitting with presidents like a couple of years being like, we know there has to be a way to do this. Um, and the bail thing that I think is the only missed opportunity in the bail conversation is that people still, um, 
when people are like emotionally, like people shouldn't be in jail because of money things. Like that's what they, that's what they'll say in a room like this. And then when you talk to them privately, they're like, but they killed somebody, right? Like that's sort of like their sort of go-to because everybody has killed somebody. That's like the, if you had been in jail, like you kill somebody, that's like people's idea of it, which is not true. You know, we arrest more people for weed than all violent crimes combined in this country. So like that is also wild. But I think that what we've not done a good job of is helping people understand what the end of bail actually looks like, right? That when bail goes away, it's replaced by three things. Either you're just released on your own recognizance, you're released with some sort of community supervision, like a check-in, an anklet, something like that, or you're detained in what's called preventative detention because like you actually did kill 10 people or so, like something was a real problem, so you probably shouldn't be out in society. And then all, everybody can be an expert on like explaining those three thinking about those three in the places we've seen this happen. Like DC got rid of money bail in 1990, like one, right? The world didn't end. This is actually not a radical thing anymore. We've actually already done it. And there are a lot of benefits to, to being out on bail. Like people who are out on bail, like they do better in their court cases. Why? Because they have time to prepare. That's not in a jail cell, right? Like there are all these things that are like a part of the bail conversation. I think that we've sort of just left out a little bit because we had people hooked on the emotional part about money but what I found is that privately, people are actually like less hooked on that. They like are, they waver a little bit on that thing because they're like, they kill somebody. And you're like, they didn't kill somebody though, right? Um, or if they're accused of killing somebody, they should have a real defense. And I think that that is like what I want to see us do better in the bail. And like help people understand that the bail funds are the stopgap until we end bail, right? Some people think the bail fund is like the answer. And you're like, no, 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 it's the answer today because we haven't figured out how to like end bail. But the end of bail is like not even radical anymore. Like we did it 20 years ago. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for all that you do. Um, Two-part question. Uh, obviously, there's so much and has been for so many years that makes you feel like you're losing hope. Um, when you think forward to 2018 and maybe even to 2020, um, are there candidates out there that you that really bring you hope and you feel are inspiring that need for change that we're all looking for? Um, and then the second piece is, since you asked this of all your guests on the pod, um, what is a piece of advice that has really stuck with you? That is the question I ask on the pod. Uh, Ocasio-Cortez uh, was, even, again, more impressed. I already loved her, and then I met her and was like, I might quit my job and come work for Ocasio. Like, literally, me and Sam, she doesn't have a policy person. Sam does all policy, and we both had this moment like, Sam, you should go do your policy. Like, Sam, you can't go because we need you, but Ocasio-Cortez needs you too. Um, so Stacey Abrams, I, like, I'm really hopeful about. Malin Mitchell, who's running to be the governor of Wisconsin. Uh, ben Jealous who's running to be the governor of Maryland. Like, I'm excited about those sort of people. It's hard. There's so many candidates who want to be on the pod, and like, I would just have a pod of candidates because there's so many incredible people running. So I just don't get to all of them. Uh, but I'm hopeful about like what we can do. I'm interested in like after 18, like how we actually build a base in for 2020. Like how do we do that in a way that's really thoughtful? I think that like getting out the vote and all the stuff for 18 is really important. I'm hopeful that we'll be successful in like taking one part of Congress back. But the game in 2020, like he could win again, you know? And I remember I supported him. I support, look, I supported him. That is not true. <laughs> <laughs> my phone got hacked and I did tweet out support for Trump, but that was because somebody hacked my phone. Um, but I supported Hillary in the Washington Post and people really slammed me for like, why are you doing this? She's such a hypocrite. And it's like, cause he could win. This is real, right? Like I believe him. And I remember talking to a senior member of Hillary's team not too long ago. And she was like, DeRay, there are people in the Muslim community calling us now. There are people in all these racial minorities calling us being like, what can we do? And she's like, I tried to tell y'all, right? So I, I believe that again about 2020 is that like, you know, I remember people saying DeRay, he doesn't have a ground game. Like he's not doing door knocking. The Trump campaign did none of the traditional stuff partly because the Russians helped them, but also because they knew that like racism was enough of a ground game, right? Like that was actually an effective strategy. And like they will be able to mobilize that again in 2020 unless we figure out how to build a different electorate and like tell a different story about the power of people's votes. And I think that we are close to that. I don't think that we're there yet. And I was on the transition team for the DNC. So like, you know, I believe on being on the inside, da 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 da. I don't think they got the answer either. So I'm more committed to like, how do we build an infrastructure outside of the system for 2020? And like, I think that's important. The advice that I've gotten that stuck with me is this idea of like, um, Cleo Wade, who's a friend and a poet, she has a saying that's not, not every ground is a battleground. And like, I really like that, that sometimes when all we've done is fight, like that's all we know how to do. And the fight has to be a part of the work, but like, there's some people who every relationship is a battle, right? Like, cause they have had to fight the world for so long. And I try and remind myself that blackness is not only, like that we are more than our pain, 
right? That like we can be something beautiful too. And I never glorify, you know, people are, people talk about this wave of activism and like all of it, da 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 And like, yeah, it's a lot of activism and stuff, but I never want to glorify the trauma that like made us be so active in the first place. So I'm active because I feel like I got to be and I'm fighting for the kids at Ta, I'm fighting for all these people and da da da. But like, I should be able to go back and be a teacher and like not have to worry about the world falling apart, right? That like, I don't glorify the pain that got us here. And like this idea of like, not every ground is a battleground stays with me. Thank you. Hi, um, I wanted to a caveat on that question is you talked about the data and then also bringing the people together to kind of like create co-design, so to speak, what it is um, that this actionable empathy can look like and any ideas on who those organizations are? Because you say you basically are a dot connector. So I'm wondering, like, could you give us some insight into who those organizations are and who that who are the people that we should be working with? Yeah, so here's sort of the hard thing, and Sam will be around afterwards too, so we can like talk about this offline. Sam, raise your hand. We love Sam. Sam's great. Um, I met Sam on Twitter actually, like in 2015. Sam literally tweeted like, "I want to help out" or whatever, and I DM'd him my phone number. We had a great call, and I was like, "We should work together. We've been together for a long time." Um, but the hard part is that there are two types of organizers, right? There's one set that really wants to be the gatekeeper. So they want you to do as much work as you do as long as you keep coming back to them, right? There's another set of organizers that say like, we want to give you the tools for you to go do sort of the thing. They're way more of the former than the latter. So some of the biggest organizations doing good work in the space don't actually want you to do anything that is not like the stuff that they tell you to do. And that's sort of one of the hardest pieces is that like there aren't good models of organizations at scale right now that could take 2,000 volunteers or 3,000 volunteers or are frankly interested in like you doing something that is not like at their direction. Sure. And that's sort of the challenge. What we would say is that like we think that we can build something that like allows more people to plug in and then go do your own thing. Like I don't care. You know, like if you want to like, for example, there's one company essentially that when people get released from prison, the money they have on commissary gets put on a debit card something like a debit card, but it's like a high, it's a debit card that every time you use it has like a crazy transaction fee. It's a scam is what it is, right? It's like a rush card. Yeah, it's like, oh, you, you, you know, we try, try to get us in trouble talking about it. It's something like what you said. Uh, but it's such a scam, you know? And like what, what I believe is that like if we made that public, showed you every place where that is, that if that was your thing, you just go do it. You know, like you go dismantle it and like, I don't need, like, if you need help, cool, we'll be there. But, like, you don't need me to, right? And, like, we did the first ever public database of police union contracts and use of force policies in the country because nobody had ever put them together. So we did all this stuff. And it's dope because there's some places where we go and, like, they need our technical assistance. They need us to come in and help because, like, we just know the landscape. There's some places that use the data and they just fought on their own. And we're like, cool, right? As long as the outcome gets, like, we don't care. Yeah. So... What we do know is we know the big buckets of how all the, of where the problems are. What we're trying to figure out is like, how do we help, how do we get people to help us find them? So when we coded the 100 largest, the 100 contracts in the, um, the 100 police union contracts in the 100 largest cities, we had like all these volunteers and Slack groups across the country, like filling in Google Docs, right? We're about to code 800 more. So we have like more volunteers helping us like sift through these contracts. And we can do it in like two weeks, what would take us like two years to do. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that's sort of the interesting scalable thing. So there aren't great models of it right now. And what you find is a lot of even the best organizations just don't, they don't know what they do with a thousand volunteers. Like they just, uh -huh. they just don't know right now. So we're trying to help people like envision organizing and being an activist and a citizen differently. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna talk to Sam afterwards too. <laughs> Thank great. you. Sam is in. We have time for one last question. Oh, a lot of pressure. All right. um, <laughs> make it good. <laughs> so, uh, I've really enjoyed everything that all of you have been uh, speaking about, and thank you for coming. Obviously, this has been really, really helpful. Um, my question is around allyship. So um, a lot of the things that you're speaking around, uh, a lot of times they come off as like minority problems or black problems or problems that are, that are focused on one specific community. Um, but when I think back to like the civil rights movement, like a lot of the people that were in the crowd during the Freedom March, like they were actually people that were white. Um, so when you think about allyship, I would be curious to hear like what you think about that and like who are people that you think are doing that well and what's that call to action look like for people that want to be allies? 
Yeah, so I think about sort of this big bucket is that we think about allies and accomplices, right? Like people's first introduction to the work is, all, is almost always being an ally, and that is like sort of standing in solidarity. We think about accomplices as people uh, who see themselves implicated in the work too, who like are not just people standing sort of near you, but standing side by side, right? Like allies sort of love you from a distance, accomplices love you up close. And like that is sort of like a, a difference of proximity is a difference there. Uh, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day who asked a similar question, and we he, we were just one on one, and he was like, "I sort of get intersectionality." He's like, "I get the idea," but he's like, "I, I often need to think about it in, in the frame of my identity, and I'm sort of struggling." He's like, "I'm not being the best ally that I could be, so can we talk about it?" Right? What I said to him is that people misunderstand intersectionality as is about being intersecting identities, and intersectionality is not about intersecting identities. Intersectionality is about intersecting uh, sets of oppression, right? So being like a black gay man is about like how my like my gayness and being black intersect. It's not just about like how like my identity is just sort of like all come together. It is rooted in the idea that these systems of oppression intersect. And that's really important. And what I ask people now is like, when was the last time you didn't feel safe? And what's interesting is that when you ask, when I've asked white men, like when the last time they didn't feel safe, they say things like when I didn't have money. And I'm like, that is fascinating. <laughs> like if that's the last time you didn't feel safe, that is like really interesting. Um, and I asked a straight black man the other day, like when he didn't feel safe, and he was like, the last time I didn't feel safe in my body was around the police, right? And it's like, that's also interesting. That like the only, that's like the last time you didn't feel safe in your body is like around a, you ask a woman when the last time they didn't feel safe, it yeah. no, had nothing to do with the police, right? Like, it might be about the police, but, like, women have all these stories about not feeling safe in their body, like, just in society, right? Or, like, you ask queer people, trans people, like, when's the time you didn't feel safe? And you actually understand, like, you understand what you don't see every day because like you're just not proximate to it. And like that has actually been, I found that question to be really helpful for people who are struggling with this ally thing. Like mm -hmm. how close are you to the issue and like what don't you see? Especially in the workplace is that you think about, you know, in, in classrooms, we sit in the back of the classroom and we can literally tally like who gets called on. You know, if you sit in classrooms and you tally positive to negative comments, you can actually learn a lot about a teacher. Because when you see the like the ratio is just so off, you're like, of course the kids are bad today because you're mean, right? Like that's why <laughs> that's why they're bad because you're like not a nice person. Um, but in the workplace, you can also tally like who gets called on first, right? Like in a lot of workplaces that call themselves like progressive, it's like always straight men who like are the first people to talk or like did it like what does that look like? Uh, I think too about in workplaces that, that look like this. It's like when what does it mean when workplaces that look like this say things like we have the best workforce and it's like no black people, no brown people. Like you're, that is actually signaling something, right? That if you can say today you employ, like you have the best workforce, when it's like less than three percent people of color, you're that is a value statement, right? And like if you don't see it like that, that is like a privilege and a luxury not to be able to see the way that that is being received by people. Not that you're like working towards having the best workplace, but if you would say that the best workplace is one that that does not mimic a society we live in like this, like that is a real challenge. So I've seen people show up with the language of allyship and not the practice of allyship, like a lot, and especially in workplaces. And what I've also seen, I did this talk at another really big company, um, and I had gone to like the airport with the vice president of whatever he does at the big place. And he was like the executive, ex executive sponsor for the black people, right? So I'm like talking to the black people later and all they have is complaints. And I'm sitting here and I go to the executive guy, I'm like, you you not sponsoring real well if all the, like if, if the people got all these complaints right like you are sponsoring from a distance and like that's just not cool right so you need to figure that out and I think about in workplaces like this is what you often find is that there's a lot of really good systemic work happening until one white person feels uncomfortable and people are like no and you're like the one way it can be like thirty black people being like I think this is like an issue that we and like the one white person who has like a fragile moment can shut everything down and like. When we, when, when a structure allows that to happen, like that is a conversation, like we need to talk about that, right? And I think about that with the allyship piece is that I've seen people in positions of power, like again, they come to, they will come to something like this talk with me and talk about the fact that they were here for the next three months and not change any practice that they've ever done, right? And like, I get that and that's not cool. Like that has to be, so we need to figure out how do we make spaces where like we can challenge like systems internally so that like they don't reproduce the same sort of things that cause us to have these talks in the first place. And like, I'm, I'm, 
I'm like more nervous about that four years after the protest began than I was at the beginning. That like we've been to a million talks, a million all this stuff, like you've been to it, I've been to it. And like some people actually haven't changed. And I do think that like the confrontation and the challenging of those people like has to be like front and center in this work. Were you about to say something? No. Okay. And the last thing I'll say is like um, this thing that we call like caretaking is that what or caretaking like splitting are two different things that what you find with some white people and black people do it is that like a white person has like a moment of they're like, oh my God, I get white privilege. They're like, I get it. This is bad. And then they split from the other white people and they like go near people of color, right? They're like, you white people are crazy. We're going to hang out with the black people. And like that sort of feels like the right thing to do in those moments. But the danger of splitting is that like white people, you need to go, you need to be with the white people, right? Like you need to be teaching the white people like you, they got to get their stuff together. Yeah. And white people have to like start leading white people. So it's not that you shouldn't be proximate to people of color. You should be, but you shouldn't like split wholly and like use your proximity to black people as a sense of as a sense of credentialing because like that actually like, doesn't push us forward in the work and the second thing that happens that we call sort of this sense of caretaking is that uh, you'll be in a room and people of color you definitely experience this you'll be in a room you'll say something people will say nothing they're like okay a white person says the same thing and people are like great idea and you're like what just happened right <laughs> and what you find is that People will coddle the white person. They'll be like, oh my God, that was such an insight. That's like, that thing about race that you said was so great. And you're like, I literally just said that. And that's my life all day. And like, we need to be mindful that like white people's discomfort is because they are just sort of realizing what's happening in the world. And that we shouldn't coddle people through that. We should like be around them and support people. But that is not like coddling. And a lot of what we do now is coddle people. And that like white privilege is really important only insofar as people link that back to like a systemic factor. Mm -hmm. So if your understanding of white privilege is limited to like, oh, the world is sort of crazy and whatever, and you've not yet done the work to realize like a system allowed that to happen for you, then like you actually haven't sort of done the work yet. And like that is a long answer to this question of like what allyship looks like. <laughs> <laughs> but a great Thank you. Right, but a great and answer. And a great answer. <laughs> cool. It's good to be here. My book comes out in September. Yes. It's called On the Other Side of Freedom. Um, excited about that. And please listen to the pod. And I'd love to, you know, Sam will be here too. I'd love to talk to whoever's around. But we are trying to figure out, like, how do we create just more space so people can have, like, less gatekeepers in the work. That you should be able to do good work and not have to be a member of anything, not have to join, like, a network. Like, you should be able to do good work because work is good to do not because like you want to join something for your whole life. And like, how do we use tech to like allow people to do that is a question that we have every day. Great. We'd like to help you answer I that. Know. Great, thank, thank you for you. the time. Thank you. Thank cool. you. Um,